Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another weekly advocacy event. Uh, my name is Jeremy Norton Paul. I'm the executive director of the Washington State Developmental Disabilities Council. And as you just heard a minute ago, just a reminder that this is being recorded. Just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. And we do have an agenda with lots of great speakers today. We just put that in the chat box. And um, actually, since Representative Schmick is here and we know his time is limited, uh, I was actually going to hand it over to him so that he can share with us because we know that he needs to leave soon. So Rep Representative Schmick, we really appreciate you being here, um, uh, representing, if I'm not mistaken, the ninth legislative district. And I'm happy to hand it over to you to, to uh, hear some of your thoughts. Well, hi everybody. And I just got a couple of things and I would really like it if I could answer some questions uh, that you have. So be thinking of those because I don't want to talk very long and I would much prefer to uh, talk about what you have in your mind. Um, one thing that I am going to ask right away about and that's uh, House Bill 1411. Now I know that that one, um, the associations and different groups are in favor of that. That is, they're, they're expanding the list of crimes that will not be counted against someone who wants to work as a provider. And personally, I'm uncomfortable, especially uh, with some of the folks in the DD community to do this. Uh, and that this is coming more from the parents who I've talked to directly that have concerns. And so that is one question that I would propose pose to you. I need some guidance and a little bit of help, uh, especially if the, uh, the DD person is non-communicative and can't communicate well, this really concerns me. And so I'm, since I have you all here, I am taking advantage of it and asking you for some guidance. And I'm happy to, I try to be an advocate for the DD community. I think um, it, to me, it's always doing the right thing. And that I do it and I'm happy to do it. But uh, anyway, I need some help on 1411. So I'd like to hear some thoughts, please. Thank you, Representative Schmidt. Go ahead and um, unmute yourself if you've got something you'd like to share or you can raise your hand or put it in the chat box. This is this is Betty Sweeterman with the DD Ombuds. And the I think the idea behind this bill is um, is one that there are people, people with disabilities that, that want to see something like this to happen. But I think the concern and um, is that are there safeguards put in to the bill? Um, are there safeguards for um, like a person being coerced into, um, so, so just some sort of like um, bumpers around this um, would be helpful. And, and it also is complicated. And, and what I haven't quite figured out um, is how this relates to then the abuse registry that, that we have. So, um, which it doesn't, address any of that so it's it it is um in my mind that yeah about so the abuse registry so I, i'm writing this down yeah so in um dshs has an abuse registry and there's certain um um you know if a person has actions where they have been put on that abuse registry um, then they're not able to um, they're not able to serve as a caregiver. So how does that um, interact with what is what they're trying to do in this bill? Okay, That's is, a, is, is a question. You. All right, thank you. This is Sharon Adolfson, and my biggest concern, and I've talked to you about this, is also um, safety for those that can't speak. It, it, like my own daughter. Um, and when we talk about having a safety net, what is the interpretation? We passed the bill, it comes back to me because I've seen interpretation of bills be kind of off a bit, whatever 
your intent is in passing a bill, the interpretation then of DD or whomever gets handed the bill is just a little different. And I think that if a bill gets passed, any bill that has to do with DD, there shouldn't be any chance that it, the interpretation is different than what your intent is, because that scares me. Well, I think that's the case with uh, any bill, frankly. Well, it uh, is. Unfortunately. Right. Ivanova, I know that you've spoken with many self-advocates. Do you want to share some of those concerns? And then Sean, I know, has his hand yeah. raised too. Uh, so um, the self-advocates that I've spoken with, and we've actually met with some of the organizers of the bill, and um, we expressed concerns with the, with, um, the how consent is made. Uh, is it really informed the consent um, for a person, and how do you make sure that a person is not influencing a person to give consent to something like this. And um, I mean, we have a hard enough time, you know, making sure that there's an abuse amongst people that don't have a, 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 a record. And so um, I think loosening that could uh, potentially, um, there could be more harm done you know, make it harder to, to stop, prevent that from happening. So um, the self-advocate that I've spoken to about this bill, they've, they've expressed deep concerns about this and uh, making sure people are safe and not being tricked into trusting somebody that they shouldn't trust. Thank you. Thank you. Sean, do you want to go ahead? This is Sean from Allies and Advocacy. I have serious concerns with this bill. I do think families might be able to hire family members with convictions if they choose. But for non-family, I want to make sure people have informed consent when hiring individuals with convictions. So the bill needs work. Yeah, I don't see in a bill right now. Thanks, Sean. Is there anyone else who wants to share with Representative Schmidt while we have him? I, I, this is Kyle. I will just real quick, like, uh, I haven't read the bill personally, but from what I heard, I would, if I was a person that had a person that ha just came out of jail or, or prison, and, but they have, depending on the, um, what he's in for, but if it's like a person that had a rape charge to or or somebody that, uh, uh, like likes to beat people up i think they should be taken off that list but otherwise if it's they have paid their time and they are they've gone through all the classes that are necessary to care for other people then and then i and then especially for nonverbal persons and a lot of people i know of are sometimes their own self guardians and they have to go through their background. And if they don't see it, it's a, it needs to be scrutinized. So I, I would vote, I would myself, if I was going to testify, I would be under other. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, let me just kind of wrap up. I apologize that I'm going to have to jet here because we're going to go on the floor here in about four minutes. I so appreciate your guidance and the help on here. I think I've written down, I've got a half page of notes here already. And so thank you so very, very much. I do appreciate it. And I just want to apologize now for not being able to spend more time with you. Um, I'm sorry. Um, That's but, okay. Yeah, but I gotta, but I gotta run. Thank you for your time. Thank yeah. you. So, we so appreciate you being here, Representative Schmidt. Good luck on the floor. And just know that there are a lot of us here who are happy to be a resource for you. Thank you so yeah. very, very much. You Thank bet. You. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. All right, everyone. Um, I'm going to look back up at the top of the agenda just to uh, make sure that we, we cover everything. It was great to hear from Representative Schmick, and Representative Banky should be here at some point soon, also.
And so when, when he gets here, we'll do the same thing as we'll do our best to work him in for the time that we have him. And so just again, my name is Jeremy Norton Paul with the DD Council. Really excited to be here today. We have a ton of awesome presenters and we're um, excited to kick off um, Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month, which starts next week. It's hard to believe that next week is March already. Um, and one thing I wanted to do before we, before we uh, go further in our agenda is I wanted to ask you a question. What is one thing that you really want or need other people to know about developmental disabilities? It, it could be, a, it could be a, a need or a hope or a wish. You can use the chat box or you can raise your hand, but I would love to know from you. You know, we're talking about DD awareness. What is something that is really important for people to know and understand about developmental disabilities? So I'll give people a chance to type in the chat box or unmute themselves if you wanna say something. I got something, Jeremy, while we're what people Go are waiting to do. Yeah, I would say people with developmental disabilities uh, is compassion, understanding, and li just a, a listening ear. More of it, it's because of the fact that it's, you never know who you're gonna run and what kind of a disability that the person may have, but it's the biggest thing is a listening ear and having compassion for that person because you never know, it's, it may take a while for you to understand where they're coming from or even understand them personally, or if it's a, or if they, they're nonverbal and they use the communication tools to be able to speak. Like I know a few people, quite a number of people. And so it's just listening, being compassionate. And that's it for me. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. And while you were sharing, I, I've got some great chats that I'll read through. Uh, Ivanova said, we all grow up. Kathy said, they want the same things as everyone else to live ordinary lives in ordinary places. Alex said, we're able to do things. Jessica says, do not assume, talk to the person directly. Debbie says, capabilities, can do. Beverly said, functioning labels and mental age should not be promoted. Tanika said, people with DD are people too and should be given an opportunity to make their own decisions about their lives. Sean says that we're like everyone else. We all have abilities, things we're good at and impairments, things we need help with. Nancy says she's always grateful when people show her daughter patience. And Marcy uh, reminds us that people with unique abilities are the best teachers. I agree with you, all of you there. So thank you so much for sharing all that. Like I said, next week is the beginning of March. So it's the beginning of, of uh, DD Awareness Month. I know there are some social media campaigns that will be up and running. Um, for example, our national association, NACDD, has a social media campaign that they're gonna start where we'll be sharing photos and posts and other things like that. And I can actually share a link to um, some of the images that they've already created. If anyone's interested in sharing these images, I'll put the, the link in the chat box now. Um, it's it's a, just some artwork that someone created um, to kick off DD Awareness Month. There's also a hashtag you can use, which is hashtag DD Awareness 2021. So um, with that, I just wanna say a quick note of thanks and gratitude to Ivanova, my, my co MC and everyone else who makes today possible, especially the Arc of Washington State and self-advocates and leadership. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ivanova, who's going to introduce our first speaker. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Ivanova Smith, and I am chair of Self Advocates and Leadership. And I'm going to be introducing our speakers. And our first speaker is the our Epic uh, Sale Policy Director, Alex Mutler. Take it away, Alex.
Good morning all. I am Alex Motteller, Policy Coordinator for Self-Advocates in Leadership. This morning I have the honor of reading Governor Inslee's State of Washington Proclamation, proclaiming March 2021 as Disability Awareness Month. Whereas, people with a developmental disability are of all racial, ethnic, educational, social, and economic backgrounds, and all are valued members of society who find fulfillment living everyday lives. And, whereas, nationwide, approximately 5 million people nationwide and more than 120,000 adults and children in Washington state have developmental disabilities, and the vast majority of these individuals are primarily or solely supported throughout their lifespan by their families. And, whereas, families of people with developmental disabilities deserve our admiration and recognition for their caring commitment and ongoing support that are both essential to an independent and productive life. And, whereas, for many of these people with developmental disabilities there is now the prospect of a brighter future and greater opportunity with increasing awareness that such disabilities need not keep individuals from realizing their full potential in school and as members of their families and communities. And whereas early intervention, education, employment, and home and community-based services continue to be vital to enabling citizens with a developmental disability to enjoy the rights of citizenship. And, whereas, new opportunities have been created through the efforts of those with developmental disabilities and their family members, along with professionals and officials who work together to bring about significant changes in the public perception of persons with developmental disabilities. And, Whereas, Washington State is committed to recognizing that every person, regardless of perceived ability, has valuable strengths, infinite capacity to learn and make decisions, and the capability to make important contributions to their communities if given opportunities to do so. And, whereas, Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month is a time to recognize Washington State's public policy accomplishments concerning persons with disabilities and to identify possible improvements to public policy that would facilitate full inclusion of Washingtonians. Now, therefore, I, Jay Inslee, Governor of the State of Washington, do hereby declare March. 2021 as Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month in Washington State, and I urge all people to join me in this special observance. Signed this 10th day of February, 2021, Governor Jay Inslee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, for reading yes. that. It's really awesome of our governor to uh, make that proclamation. So thank you, Governor Inslee, and thank you, Alex, for reading it to everyone. Uh, so now we're gonna go on to our next presenter. Uh, and he, this uh, person was a great mentor to me when I first started out in the advocacy world, Eric Mathers. And he will be talking about the risk of COVID-19 for people with Down syndrome. Take it away, Eric. Thank you, Ivan. No. Oh. Thank you, Ivanova. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Mathis. I have Down syndrome. I live in the 34th Legislative District. Also, I am lucky that I work for a place that takes care of people with developmental disabilities. So I was able to get vaccinated, but other people with developmental disabilities, especially those with Down syndrome, deserve to be protected and prioritized for the vaccine. I have an interest in my own health. Uh, through the Arc of King County has created a series of videos that shows that people with disabilities can cook and stay healthy. Down syndrome is a result change in chromosome 21 and is most common genetic cause for intellectual disability. It's associated with co 
occurring health conditions that may increase the risk for more severe infections from COVID-19. As far as experts know, people with Down syndrome are infected with a virus at the same rate, but some may be greater, greater risk for severe illness from COVID-19. Individuals with Down syndrome, especially those older than 40, are more vulnerable to medical complications and increased risk for death related to COVID-19. Therefore, individuals with Down syndrome should be considered a priority group for COVID-19. Advocates wrote a letter to Governor Inslee and the Washington State Department of Health shared this with them, which I support. People with developmental disabilities are at higher risk of most people experiencing COVID related health complications and death. Those ages 18 through 74 are 150 to 200 percent more likely to die after contacting COVID than the general population. The increased risk even more produced for the specific disability groups, for example, with Down syndrome, are five times more likely to be hospitalized and 10 times more likely to die. After contracting COVID, the, the gener general population, additionally, people with disabilities from Black immigrant and people of color communities experience even greater risk due to existing structure, health insecurities, and compounding intersection of race and disability. 44 developmental disability organizations signed on to respectfully request that COVID-19 vaccine distribution plan explicitly address people with developmental disabilities ages 16 through 64 who lives in the community in their own home or family home and unpaid family caregivers who support them. They also urge the governor to consider prioritizing parents of young children with special health care needs whose disabilities are often a accompanied by life-threatening medical conditions and are particularly vulnerable to the virus. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eric. That is really important advocacy. Uh, we're now going to move on to our next presenter, Courtney Thorne, uh, who will speak about Down syndrome and dementia. Take it away, Courtney. Thank you, Avinova. I will be talking about people with Down syndrome and, de and dementia. The issues are rife with respect to dementia and Down syndrome. Not every adult will show signs of dementia at C, he or she ages. The years for known the signs of M. CI and dementia can keep track of capabilities after the age of 40. Aging adult. Now I'm going to talk about the percentages of the, the percentages of people with Down syndrome who develop dementia at different ages. The age percentage of with clinical signs of dementia when they are in the 30s is the two percentile. 
the eight. So four years is ten to fifteen percent. The age of fifty is thirty three percent. Sixty and beyond is fifty to seventy percent. Now I'm going to go into aging adults with ID. All a vulnerable population. The MA needs better help when dementia systems arises. May has significant cold binds from a lifetime of challenges. They often need special specialized housing and care settings to be fluid, being, being institutionalized at the age. It could, could be residing with older parents who themselves are declining and may need additional help. May be difficult to access due to lifelong cognitive impairments or inability to self report. Can benefit from partnerships and arrangements between aging and networks of IDD providers. Since I'm turning 30 on March 1st, during DD awareness, I'll be in the two percentile. That's what I have about Down syndrome and dementia. Thank you very much for that information, Courtney. That, that was very formative and really good for all of us to be aware of. <coughs> uh, now, uh, oh, so, uh, just I'm going to. Uh, there were some in comments uh, for those who are interested in the Dementia Action Co Collaborative is focusing on this issue among others. And it looks like Jeremy's put in a link uh, for more information on that issue. Uh, also, Jeremy posted, I believe they are working on creating some training materials for providers who support people with IDD and dementia. Uh, and great job, Courtney and Eric. Uh, both of your done. issues are really important. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our next speakers, uh, Zoe Osborne and Darcy Ledwick, who will be talking about using parent supports. Take it away. Are you ready? Okay, can you tell everybody hi? Tell them hi. Hi. And tell them what your name is. Hi. And how old are you, Zoe? No, you're 18. You just turned 18. And um, Zoe, you live in what legislative district? The fourth legislative district. And um, can you tell them who I am? Mom. Mom. And I also, my name is Darcy. And um, thank you for letting us talk today. I'm Zoe's mom. I'm her caregiver. I'm her navigator. I'm her transition team and I'm her co-advocate. Zoe, like many of the 44,439 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities living in the community with their families, 90% of the DDA clients, needs someone to not only care for her, but care about her. I am currently filling both of those roles. My role as parent advocate didn't magically end when Zoe turned 18. My role as her mom is to help her to get the services that she needs and continue to seek opportunities for Zoe to be empowered, especially now that she is an adult. Each of us has different support needs to access our community. Sometimes <laughs> self-advocates like Zoe, Zozo, um, need their parents in order for their voice to be heard. Um, Zoe and I have had great conversations, but sometimes other people don't understand don't give her time to answer things for herself or her, allow her to try things. Hi. She, Hi. we Hi. find this very frustrating, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Uh, nope, we're not done. <laughs> so he likes to talk about what's done when we're done. Um, she needs support to be involved. And I am impassioned my, my, by my role advocating alongside of her. So he does best with routine and loves to talk about what's next and know when things are done as you just witnessed. Um, 
Zoe loves to oh, yeah, help. Yeah. What do you love to do? You love to help, help mommy and feel needed. She's very caring and worries about the well-being of others. Um, what do you like to help mom with? She likes to help with laundry. Um, do you like to help with book work? So our kitchen table has become the classroom as well as a workstation. And so when we're sitting at the kitchen table, is that, what is that? It's work. How good, so people can hear you. Huh. Work. You like to help um, mom in the kitchen. You like, um, Zoe has a feeding tube for most of her nutrition and you like to help with that too, right? You show me where it goes and you like to hold up. We do it by gravity. So you like to hold it up so um, you can feed yourself. Um, Zoe loves to go to school, don't you? And what do you miss most about school? Can you say it loud so everybody can hear you? Bus. <laughs> she loves the bus. Um, she's been participating remotely for the last year. And with some assistance, she's able to access <gasps> Zoom meetings and she loves social interaction with her peers. Um, what, what, do you like, um, what do you like to do outside? She likes to go running, which um, involves her mom. So she's her mom's personal trainer. Okay. Um, we like to go running. And what, uh, what other things do you like to do? What do you do every day with your dad? She does FaceTime at nighttime for her, with her dad. It's very important to her. And also, um, what have you become really good at during COVID? You know, you're good at, so um, we got a cornhole game early in COVID and Zoe is quite the avid cornhole player. She, what do we call cornhole? Oh, well, we got. No, that's what you tell me when we run. Go, mom, you go. She calls um, cornhole red blue, don't you? Because the bags are red and blue. And she's um, gained some strength, coordination, and real sportsmanship. Don't um, oh, wow. you? Yeah. You were so excited about this and now you're being crazy. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, guess, um, can you tell them what we're getting on Friday? What are we getting on Friday? Bobby! We're getting a puppy. And we're very excited. And Zoe's so excited because she gets to help care for the puppy. And what kind of things are you going to do for the puppy? Oh, you're going to feed the puppy nummies. You're going to feed the puppy food. Um, and are you going to play with her? And are you going to let, where, well, where will she go to the bathroom? Will she go inside or outside? Outside. So you'll help let her outside and take her for walks. Um, so I've been Zoe's advocate from day one. When I joined this amazing community of parents, families, and self-advocates, I knew I found my people. I'm pretty proud of the young woman that Zoe has become. In our journey, I haven't met one family member who doesn't have their son or daughter's best interest in mind. We've, found hard, we've fought hard for our sons and daughters to be part of the community, for systems to be inclusive, and to meet our um, son and daughter's needs. We continue to fight for the <laughs> systems that fully support Hi. our sons. And, there you are right there. Um, needs so that they can move into a home of their choosing with adequate supports, uh -huh. Uh -huh. get a job, be independent, find love, have a great social life, travel, and be included in this world. Zoe's okay. happiness, her ability to be all that she wants to be and have her best life is everything to me. I will stop at nothing to make sure that she gets everything to succeed and fail as everyone else does. Um, do you have anything else to say? Mm. No, nothing to say. Can you say thank you for letting me talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's awesome seeing your loving relationship that you have with each other. And uh, that's what you know. parenting all about is supporting uh, your self-advocate offspring and uh, I really admire that. So thank you for sharing your story and sharing your life with us. All right. So now I am going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, I enjoy working with him a lot, Sean Latham. Take it away, Sean. He will be speaking on uh, no community living, no nursing facility. Take it away. I don't know that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Latham, Director of Allies and Advocacy. 
a self-advocacy organization fighting for the civil and equal rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It was the 1800s, and for too long, people who were poor and had little opportunity needed support. This was when many countries started courthouses or almshouses to give people a place to go when they didn't have one. Then came advocates like Dorothea Dix, who with the help of Dr. Samuel Grayley Howe, started to create houses specifically for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. At first, these houses were set up as educational places, in addition to residential ones, where the goal was to help residents learn skills so that they could return to the community. Unfortunately, due to the civil war and the financial crisis afterwards, these homes went from helping people succeed in life to just putting hundreds of people in them, out of the way of society, without any way to get out, and having their rights as citizens taken away from them. From this point in history to the 1960s, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities were thrown into these places and oftentimes forgotten about. In Washington state, at the height of the DD institutional model, over 4,000 individuals resided in them. Luckily though, during the civil rights movement and the start of the self-advocacy movement, and through documentaries like Geraldo Rivera's film, On the Terrible Conditions at Willowbrook School in New York, people started to witness that DD institutions were more like a prison than a home to support and assist people to be independent. It was from this time until now that many of our country's institutions closed and those with intellectual and developmental disabilities got to experience real life in the community with real supports. I am personally thankful that I grew up in the 80s and 90s and that I had parents who saw me as an individual with potential. Sure, they were still encouraged by some doctors to place me in a DD institution, but at this time in history, they saw that I would have way more opportunities to succeed in the community than being locked away out of it. This brings me to today. While we have made progress, we have a ways to go. There are still 584 individuals residing in our remaining four institutions. While these places have improved slightly since the 60s, they still operate like a nursing home facility instead of like a home. We know we can do better. And we are doing better for thousands of individuals who access care in the home or in state-operated living alternatives, in companion homes, in adult family homes, and in supportive living homes. While each one of these places vary in support, they are all located in the community and allow individuals to go to town, get a job, socialize with friends, have access to community doctors and much, much more. These residential settings aren't perfect, and us advocates will probably keep asking legislators for changes to them. But they do support people. They do provide nursing level care in smaller residential settings. And they also get us away from a housing model that for nearly 200 years have been viewed by many people with intellectual and developmental disabilities as frightening, trauma-inducing, and isolating. I plead with the governor and our state legislators today to move us forward and not backwards. I plead with them to build more community residential options and not congregate living options. I plead with them to improve community services. Finally, I plead with them to close the remaining institutions and choose community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, son. That's really important. Shut them down. I 100% agree that we need people to be able to live in a community and get the support they need in the community. Uh, so our next guest speaker is uh, John Lemus, um, who I'm good friends with, and uh, is going to speak to us about employment. Take it away, John.
Good afternoon, everybody, or morning, wherever you are. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about employment this morning. Um, employment is really important to people with developmental disabilities. Um, for many of us, it's how we connect to our communities. It's how we find our purpose, but is also how we take care of ourselves and pay our bills and how we do everything that we want to do. So we ask legislators to continue to fund community employment so that people with disabilities can be productive um, tax paying citizens while also getting the support that they need to work. Um, I've had a pretty big employment history um, and I'm thankful for the opportunities that I've had um, to be able to do the work that I love to do and be supported to do that work. Um, so I think it's important that we, we self-advocates who are working continue to share our success stories so that the legislature and DDA can see um, the awesome work that that funding is doing. So um, I also want to encourage our legislators to support um, equity in wages paid to people with disabilities. As many of you know, um, there is a subminimum wage bill that Ivanova and I have been working pretty hard on with some of our community partners. Um, and it just got introduced in the House. And this bill would ban the use of subminimum wage in the state of Washington. And this is important because people with disabilities shouldn't just be paid less just because they have a disability. I know several people without disabilities who are bad at their jobs and still get paid minimum wage or higher. Um, so I don't think that having a disability should be the basis of being paid less. Um, that is the biggest civil rights abuse that people with disabilities have faced in our time. And we're going to do everything that we can this session to make sure that subminimum wage is no longer an option in the state of Washington. Um, and that individuals who work are respected for the work that they do and paid just like everyone else for the work that they do. So I would appreciate all of you who are in support um, to um, send your legislators a message, um, letting them know to pass um, Senate Bill 5284, which has just made its way over to the House. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. It's really exciting. Uh, it just passed the Senate, and so now it's on its way to the House, and we're very excited um, for its passage, and hopefully it will be on the governor's desk this year. Uh, so, uh, really good stuff. All right, so our next presenter is the awesome and who I kind of see as one of the forefathers of the self-advocacy movement here in Washington, uh, Mike Raymond, who is also the president of People First of Washington. He is going to share a video about aging and uh, full life and aging. Um, so let's start that video up. Thank you for being here, Mike. I thought Diane was supposed to help me. Yes, Diane's here. Okay. okay. Okay, so we did Mike's video yesterday, but it had a lot of echoing. And so we're going to do, we're going to ask the questions again for you, Mike, right now. Okay. Okay. Can you tell people where did you grow up? I was in the institution for 20 years. And which institution was that? Rainier State School. Yeah. Okay, so you were there for 20 years. How did you get out? My sister got me out. And who else did she get out? You guys all did. 
And what about Diane? Did she help you get your girlfriend out? My wife, she was my girlfriend. She got my sister helped her out too. And then you guys got married? Got married, yeah, we sure did. And where did you live when after you got married? In my in our new house. So you bought a house, you owned your own home? Yep. So you're married, you've got your own home. Um, what do you do for a job? Uh, where did not, you work at? I used to, I worked at Goodwill. Yeah, you were there for a long time. So yeah. what else did you do with your time? You've got, you're, you're married, you've got your own home, you've got a job. Um, did you get active in anything else? I got active on boards. Yep, you got us on some boards. What about that? People first. South Advocacy, uh, the Governor's Committee. Yep. So you were really active there throughout your life. Right. So your daughter is Tara. You right. And where is she? She's in. She's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And she's a teacher. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. She sure is. And do you have any grandkids? Yep. One grandkid. That's very cool. So how long have you been doing advocacy? You've been doing it a long time, haven't you? Yep. Did you ever I, go to advocacy days? Oh, I, uh, I like to be, I like to, uh, be a part of uh, the South Advocacy. I like it really well. And I get to, I get I get to see my friends and stuff. Yeah. So before COVID, you used to get out and about, see people all the time. Right. Sure did. And did you go down to Olympia for advocacy days? Sure. And what did you, you do when you went to Olympia? I used to go down with you, Diane. Yeah. And I, and they knew and they knew what what kind of candy did I like. <laughs> yeah, they always had the chocolates that you liked for you, didn't they? Right. But, so what message did you tell them? Shut the institutions down. Yep, that was your main message. Right. Why do you want the institution shut down? Because the reason why I want them shut down for those people in there that don't belong in there. Yeah, there's people who want out and they can't get out. Right. You were lucky somebody was able to get you out and you got your own home to live in. Right. So how old are you now, Mike? I am 75. 75 years old. I bet that's probably older than anybody on this call. Right. <laughs> so what's it feel like to get older, Mike? It, oh, it feels, it feels like that I would like to do the same stuff like everybody else. But do you need a little bit more help now that you're older? Yeah. And so do you get that help where you're living at now? Oh, yeah. Except for COVID, you can't get out as much as you'd like to, can you? Right. So you've had a very busy life living in an institution for 20 years getting out, getting your girlfriend out, getting married. How long were you married? I think about 47. 47 years. That's a long time. Yeah. So you were married. You have a daughter who also has a son herself. So you have a grandson. 
Right. And as you've gotten older, you need a little bit more support to do things sometimes. But you're not stopping now, are you? Nope. <laughs> so what do you want to do from here, Mike? From here, I want to help people. Help people get out of the institutions. That's a good goal to still have. And I think many of us are trying to work on that. Well, thank you, Mike, for taking time to share about your life with us. Yeah. And, and I'm looking forward to you continuing to work towards shutting them down. Oh, oh. yeah. That's right. I will. And, and I'm still going to finish watching this because I'm enjoying it. Well, good. We're glad you're here. And hopefully they, they'll help you get on every week so you can watch it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you bet. So back to you, Ivanova. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for sharing your, uh, your life story and uh, everything that you continue to do for the South Advocacy Movement. You're awesome and epic, and I've always looked up to you. So thank uh, you. Thank you for your advocacy. Uh, so our next presenter is actually... Um, a question marker starting on the journey. Um, oh. uh, that is Alma Balderas. Alma Balderas. Uh, Alma Balderas will be speaking on starting on the journey. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, Alma. Hi. Um, well, thank you for having me here. And um, my name is Alma Valderas, and I am a mom to um, three human kids and two furry four-legged ones. Um, Casey is 13, David is 11, and Nico is five. And we have a 12-year-old lab uh, and an eight-year-old beagle um, who I make sure that we're busy so I can talk to you guys today. Um, we started our journey and the disabilities world um, via our son, Nicholas. Uh, we call him Nico for short. He is five now uh, at about 18 months. Um, we were ready in the isolating state. And I'm sure a lot of us can recall being in that state or if we're on it still where you decline invitations even from your own family where um, you just simply make it easier to stay away from everything and everyone because it's simply the easiest thing to do. Um, so at 18 months, the older kids were really struggling with our quality of life just changing. And Nicholas was showing big signs of big emotions, was not speaking. And um, I just I just knew if he can tell us what he was feeling, what he was experiencing, I felt like it will fix me. You know? And I just dove right in looking for resources for him. Um, many, many challenges, not just with the big kids, um, but our solar pets where he was harming them. And aside from self-harm, which was heartbreaking. And uh, we found um, the birth to three program in our local school district, which then got turned over to our specialty clinic, um, which we're a part of now. Um, if some of you are familiar with Yakima Children's Village, it's become our second home. <laughs> and um, once we started the journey with the early intervention program and the birth degree program, um, it just became a little bit clear to me that we just need to get him talking. We need to get him talking. So then we walk into the children's village um, and I had probably the highest hopes in the world. And I knew what I wanted for Nicholas at the time. I was gonna ask for speech therapy and I was not gonna leave without that resource, you know? 
And, you know, I was just like, okay, Alma, this is the time to speak up. And we show up and boy, was I blindsided. I think I had early, early on, I probably only heard the word autism maybe twice in my life. And after that gut-wrenching evaluation of three hours, you know, the screaming, the yelling, the head banging during the evaluation, um, we're given the diagnosis of autism, disruptive behavior disorder, and speech delay. And at the time, I remember just feeling numb and kind of upset. And I was certain that they had the wrong chart and they had the wrong patient. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I said that to this, to the doctor. And um, and I walked out of there. I cannot even remember what that week was like. The only thing I can surely recall is just the kindness that followed it. Um, from us being walked by the hand, it felt like we were introduced to um, the folks at Parent to Parent program. And I felt like once the cloud kind of got lifted, it was just time to work. I was like, okay, it's time to learn about this. Let's get to work. Let's pick up our sleeves and get, get right into it. And we did. And I say we, because it was an entire family effort. Um, our entire family was being affected, all three of my kids, my pets, myself, and we did, we dove right in. Um, we were fortunate enough to participate in things from the ABA therapy, speech, he has gotten hippotherapy, he has uh, sensory therapy, he has also um, been a part of the uh, tasting group because for the longest time he would only eat three things um, and had an extremely difficult unhealthy gut which then started a domino effect of other medical issues um, and we just kept right at it we just kept right at it from my children attending the sip shops which gave them an outlet to um, not only meet other siblings whom had, um, who have similar experiences and, but it also gave them their own space. It gave them their own space, you know, and aside from their friends who may not understand what they're going through. Um, so all in all, it became just a big group effort. And from there, we have seen our lives drastically changed. We still have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. We, um, we require a lot, we do. Um, I haven't been able to rejoin the workforce as a bookkeeper, that's my trade, since I've been home with Nicholas because this job for me of being his mom and my children's mom it's a lot more important at the time. And it's always gonna be, but this is what it's, it's taking for us to be able to have some kind of a higher quality of, of life. It really is. Um, and I'm just extremely proud of the kids from my older kids to just taking on the role of these amazing protectors any, any chance they get I feel like they're talking about autism and they're talking about their friends who have other different disabilities and they're educating it you know I don't remember being that wise at 13 and 11 year old and I'm extremely proud of them Nicholas is probably one of the hardest working children I've ever known in my life and he um he is five now. He just turned five in January. He, a month before he turned five, um, he stopped using pull-ups, which I never, I didn't have a cap. I didn't know when that was going to end. I didn't know. We've been going at his pace. He is benefiting from all the speech he's receiving both at his school and at the village. Um, and he's trying so hard to use his words. One of the 
biggest things that I'm extremely proud of him for is something that a lot of the times we take for granted as, as just humans. And it's the ability to just self-soothe and to calm ourselves down, you know, because even as adults, we have these big emotions. Children learn how to handle their big emotions. But you take someone like Nicholas that can go from zero to 100, and we call it his little Hulk stage. And it really is that. It really is, you know, but he's in pain. And it's incredibly painful to watch your child be in that much pain. Um, but he's learning his calming techniques. And that is huge. That is absolutely huge. I can not tell you how amazing it is that I'm sitting here telling you that at five years old, he went from banging his head to biting, to pinching himself, to finding anything that he can slam his body to out of frustration, to him breathing, holding something tight, using his weighted blanket, his favorite stuffy. Like that is incredible for me to say about him. And in all honesty, I couldn't have helped them get to this point without any of the resources, any of the tools that, that we've gotten, that we've gotten. We use them as, as a household. My older children, they use those techniques as a household. We have the same verbiage for a lot of our um, emotions and a lot of our communication now because you know, it really does take the whole village, you know? And um, so I'm incredible thankful for that. We've also were, been a part of the Holland group, which we miss so very much to be in person with our people. And that's really what it becomes. They become your people. They become the people that just get you. They're gonna love you, your child, your entire family, just because you exist, that they're gonna understand that this morning, it was a battle to get out of the house and into school, but we did it. So they're gonna celebrate with you, you know? And Nicholas went from not being able to notice anybody. And right now, if he were here, he went for a walk with our caregiver, but if he were here, he'd be wanting to say hi to each and every one of you. And again, that engagement that um, I want to be around people, I want to be around my family, it, it's such a big gift to us, you know, and um, we couldn't have done it on our own. I didn't, I wouldn't have known how to get him here. I really wouldn't have. And as much as I love to self teach myself at certain things and just read and research, there's no way. There's no way I had to be taught to become his mother. And that in itself was a little bit of the human part of me that took an ego, you know, slash a little bit. However, it needed to happen in order for me to become the parent that Nicholas needed, the parent that Casey needed, the parent that David needed as a whole. And, um, Again, I just could not be proud. I cannot be more thankful uh, of our groups, our resources. And um, right now we're finishing our second round of ABA. After the COVID shutdown, we regress quite a bit. And again, that child just gets right to work. Just gets right to work. He is in preschool and um, he has an amazing support in preschool and they are confident that he's gonna move up to kinder the next, the next year, and they will follow with him in his, um, in his journey there to make sure that he has the transition as positive as possible as he can. Um, again, you know, I just could not be more thankful for this because they just gave us a sense of, a sense of just life. Everything was so dark for so long. Everything was so hectic. Everything was so, I mean, I think for the first two years of his life, there was not a single night that I would not 
cry myself to sleep because I needed the kids to be okay. I needed them to see a strong parent. And it was hard for me to show that emotion. But I was damaging them a little bit because they probably thought they couldn't show me that they were hurt and suffering. And as part of being in these hauling groups and these zip shops, it gave us a sense of just, it's okay to not be okay sometimes. It's okay to get that wow. stuff out, you know? And um, I think from there, like, just like I said, our quality of life has improved tremendously. And I say ours because it, it just took all of us. It took all our energy. It took all of us to be able to um, work through all of this with him. And we're still, and we're going to do it. We're still going to do it. We're going to continue doing it. Um, I see it in my children and every single one of them. And my goal is for Nicholas to be able to show what he's capable of and how important it is for him to have these tools and resources available to him because that, that gave him a sense of, of, it brought him out. It just did. Nicholas was always in there and he came out when he was ready. Yes, thank you. So Alma, do you want to mm -hmm. share a little bit about what people can expect next week for Advocacy Day? Absolutely. Um, I know um, during our um, Advocacy Days, we're, we're going to have the closed captions available. Uh, next week, the topic will be on education. And uh, for that one, there will be a Spanish interpreter um, live available as well. Um, I would like to say that in Spanish right now um, for our Spanish speaking folks. Uh, la, durante nuestros días de abogancia que estamos teniendo virtualmente, los subtítulos siempre van a estar disponibles. Pero la siguiente semana el tema va a ser sobre la educación y para ese tema tendremos interpretación en vivo y en español y esperemos que puedan atender aún. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alma. Thank, thank you for telling your story. It's really powerful. And I'm so happy for all the progress that your son has made and keeps making. Uh, I know it was very hard growing up myself, so I really relate with your son. I was probably the same way when I was five years old. I was nonverbal back then as well. Mm, I, I really that. relate with that. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to uh, go on to Diane Stadden, who will be talking to us about the bills of interest. Um, Alessa, Representative uh, Bo uh, uh, I haven't seen Representative Banky come in yet. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, then how about you just... Uh, Talk to us through the bills of interest and Diane, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna take a second to share my screen here. There we go. So we've passed um, a couple of cutoffs for bills to make it through their um, policy committee, first of all, and then the fiscal committee. And so now all the bills are sitting waiting to get a hearing on the chamber floor in the House and the Senate. Um, we've had some of them that have already passed uh, the House or Senate, and so that's a good thing. Uh, we had two uh, budget bills that passed, um, and they've already been signed by the governor now. He just signed them, and so what it does is it takes the rainy day funds, extra money that our state keeps set aside for emergencies. And it takes all that funding and puts it toward um, services for people with developmental disabilities with the provider rates and a lot of things that 
costs more money during COVID. They had to get gloves and masks and stuff. And, you know, the providers all had to buy that stuff. Well, the federal government said, we'll give you some matching money to pay for that extra stuff you had to pay for during COVID. And our state realized that if they took the rainy day funds and also put that there, we'd get a whole bunch more federal money by because they match everything we put up. So these two bills did that for last year and through June of this year. And so those two bills have passed and we got extra money into our state from the federal government because of it. Um, the foster care bill, we have a bill, House Bill 1061, so that when children who have developmental disabilities and are in foster care, they have to leave the system once they become a, adults and then they have no supports. Well, if they have a developmental disability, this bill would make it so that Developmental Disabilities Administration or DDA would pick up and start providing services for those kids so they're not just dropped off. Um, there's a number of education bills. House Bill 1044 um, makes a pathway for uh, people who are in prison to get some additional education and vocational skills if they qualified for an IEP or their individual education plan in school, then they would be prioritized to get some extra help to get some skills. So when they get out of prison, they have something to back them up and do. Uh, I'm not gonna go through every one of these because that would take us a while. Um, one of them, House Bill 1213, and it has a matching bill, 5237. So these are companion bills, basically the same thing. One's running in the House, one's running in the Senate. And both of them are still going. They're in House rules um, on second reading, which means they're just waiting for uh, legislators to pull them to the floor for a vote. And this is called the Fair Start for Kids Act. And it enhances the rate that is paid for providers doing birth to three services, like you heard from Alma. Um, and it also provides some in-home parent support and expands those services a bit. And so that's a good early learning bill um, and childcare bill for people. Uh, getting prioritized for doing it when they go back to in-person instruction, which some school districts are starting to, um, kids who are on an IEP are gonna be prioritized so that they're not the last ones to get put back in school, but instead will be the first in the first groups. Uh, promoting the Office of Education Ombuds. Next week, we're gonna be go covering a lot of these education bills and Senator Claire Wilson will be joining us next week to talk about these because a lot of these bills started with her. Um, in civil rights, I don't know what, oh, it's down here. House Bill 1411 is the one that uh, Representative Schmick was talking about and asked questions about earlier. And um, we've left it under review because there is a lot of discussion about it, um, trying to make sure whether this is the right thing to do or not with people with developmental disabilities. Uh, I had seen somebody in the chat wrote, what were the crimes that somebody could um, do and be eligible for this? And that's part of what has parents worried because if they committed extortion or assault, they would be um, allowed to care for people with DMD and apply to do that unsupervised. And those kind of uh, crimes, people get a little worried about, is that gonna reoccur? Um, so if you have more concerns or ideas about that bill, contact your legislators. That's important for you to do too. Um, we really appreciate that Representative Schmick was ask, asking for um, feedback from our, our community, but it's important that we all talk to our legislators. 
Uh, back up here, House Bill 1227 is one that self-advocates are especially in support of because especially over in Eastern Washington, there are parents who have a developmental disability who had children. And when they went to the hospital and they had their child, CPS stepped in because a nurse or a doctor said, oh, I don't think this person um, can safely take care of this baby. And they would take the baby away right at the hospital without any reason other than the, that the parent had a developmental disability. And this would put more protections in place if they're accused like that at the hospital with no um, basis, they can't just take their child away. They'd have to have more grounds for doing so than just because the person has a disability. So we're following that one too. Uh, one of the big bills for the, us this year is Senate Bill 5268. And that looks to start reforming our DV system, um, the service system. It would help with uh, staffing and community residential. Um, it would caseload forecast a number of our services, which we're the only agent, DBA is the only agency that is not caseload forecast. And because of it, they have a waiting list of almost 15,000 people. Um, and the reason they're waiting is there's no funding that is being given to their programs. Well, if we were caseload forecasts like other agencies in the state, there would be no waiting list because if you qualified, you would get served. So that is a big piece of that bill, but it's also about trying to downsize and eventually get rid of the state institutions, the residential habilitation centers. Um, so there's a lot of things we're watching that bill for to see and, and through this process, lots of things can happen to it. It can change, things can be taken out of it or added in. Um, we actually have an amendment for when it goes on the floor for a vote um, to clarify about crisis stabilization and making sure a person doesn't lose their home if they have to go into crisis stabilization services. Um, the last one, Senate Bill 5284, John Lemus talked about, and that's the eliminating subminimum wage bill. And so, you know, that's something that we're waiting to see what happens. It's already passed in the Senate. And so now it's in the House Labor and Workplace Standards Committee. And so we'll be watching for a hearing on that, but it probably won't happen until March 10th because through March 9th, they'll be trying to pass as many bills on the floor as they can. So Ivanova, I will turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Diane, for that wonderful information. And now we are going to hear from Alex Mottler about what you can do um, after this briefing. After attending this briefing, you have many options to advocate to your legislators. You can schedule a Zoom with your legislators, testify at a hearing, email your legislators about bills that are important to them, watch each advocacy day afterwards on our website, email to get virtual appointments with your legislators. You can watch hearings on TVW, 
You can sign in to testify at future hearings. You can sign in pro, con or other, or submit written testimony on a bill. And be sure to join us for future Advocacy Days. We need to make sure you are satisfied with Advocacy Day. Be sure to fill out our feedback form. Let's walk through it together. Advocacy Day is a project of the ARC of Washington State and funded by the Developmental Disabilities Council. Your feedback helps us to continue improving and helping your voice to be heard. Start by putting in your email address. Next, you select the Advocacy Day you are giving input for. Today is February 24th, DD Awareness Day. Then you respond if this is your first Advocacy Day or not. Next, you pick the smileys that answer how you feel about the virtual Advocacy Day. Then you submit the form. Just as easy as that. Your input helps Diana and the ARC to know what you like, what you don't like, what is helpful, what is not helpful. You can learn all about these and more ideas to get involved on our website at www.arcwa.org and click on Advocacy Days. You can also contact us at sale at arcwa.org or diana at arcwa.org if you need help. Are there any questions? I just had a question. Can we have the website for the feedback again, please? Uh, the website is posted in the chat box, the link to go to the feedback form. Thank you. Looks like Deborah, do you have your hand up? Do you want to ask something? Yes. How do I get to that, um, is that every time I come, do I fill out that form or is it just starting next week? This is Jeremy Deborah, and I can answer that. Yes, every week it, it's the same form, but when you okay. fill it out, you'll mark which day you're giving feedback for. So for today, you would go in there and click February 24th. And then next okay. week you'll click March 3rd. And that helps us um, each week, it'll be better and better. And then especially for next year too. Okay, can you guys um, send it to my email or? Yeah, we can definitely do that. Do you want to either sh send us your email in the chat box or just sit, say it out loud, whichever you feel more comfortable with? It's D-E-M-A Z-O-O -O, Lady L-A-D-Y at Gmail dot com. Okay. Yeah, we'll send that to you, Deborah. Thank you. And I could do that over email. Yeah, you, you can ask through an email. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I do have something to say. Go my ahead, birthday, My birthday is next Wednesday, the day that we have accuracy day, so I won't be at accuracy days. Well, thank yes, you for letting me I'll be doing oh. the big trio next Wednesday. Awesome. Happy birthday. Oh, post pre birthday. <laughs> Did you say the big three O, Courtney? Yes. Nice. Well, happy birthday a week early. Thanks. Awesome. My day, my birthday, the next, the very next day. Well, happy birthday to you too, Josie. I'll be, I'll be 41. That's a good age. A lot of people tell me I do not look it. Yeah. Mike, you have your hand up? Yeah. 
I would like to join you guys again next Wednesday. I really would. Great. Same time. We would same love place. to have you. Okay. Thank you. Um, real quickly, uh, it looks like we're uh, coming to near the end of our meeting. I wanted to introduce you to a number that you couldn't see on screen, but now you can. This is little baby Hildegard. Oh, cute. She was born February 11th at 6, 19 p.m. So she's only uh, about 12 to 13 days old. Wow. Just wanted you guys to meet her real quick. <laughs> she's a happy little girl. Little he's, just, he's just like you. You're yeah. happy. So oh, she yeah. is officially our youngest advocate in training, Ivanova? Yes, she's our youngest little advocate in training. <laughs> she definitely Listening to is. advocacy days, basically from the moment she was born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh, she's the uh, at the, 10th, the February 10th advocacy day, so I think it got her excited to come out. <laughs> I just wanted you guys to see her real quick. <laughs> Maybe to be an, an advocate just like you. <laughs> Maybe. Thanks, Ivy. She's beautiful. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, it doesn't look like Representative Banky was able to get off the floor to join us today, but we did have Representative Schmidt here, so we appreciate that he was able to join. Um, this next little bit, we, we realize that we're not in person at Advocacy Day like we would normally be, um, but we want people to have a little bit of time to socialize and, you know, talk with each other. And so we will just leave the Zoom open for a while so that people can visit with each other. But that will be the end of this week's Advocacy Day. And we really hope you'll join us next week for Advocacy Day on Early Intervention and Education. And uh, Senator Claire Wilson will join us. We will do the live transcribing again and also have Spanish interpretation available for those who want that. So really encourage you to share with your friends, your family, on your social media, and let people know. Thanks for being here. Everybody